Welcome to Implement This with Microsoft Business Solutions MVP Britta Rexted and co-host Matthew C. Anderson, where we have an insider's discussion around the things we consider when implementing Dynamics 365. In today's episode, sponsored by Kingsway Soft, Britta and I discuss queues, queue management, and routing rules in Dynamics 365. Kingsway Soft is a leading integration solution provider offering software solutions that make data integration affordable and painlessly easy. Thousands of enterprise clients from over 70 countries and regions rely on Kingsway Soft to integrate data with various business systems in order to drive their business efficiency and fully leverage information assets. Kingsway Soft is a leading provider of Microsoft Dynamics integration software, including Dynamics 365, CRM, NAV, AX, GP, SL, as well as many other applications. Check out their version 6 release of the SSIS prod, featuring seven new components, including support for Azure Blob Storage, Google Sheets, and a new data profiler transformation component. We thank Kingsway Soft for their sponsorship, and now on with the show. And now we're back with another episode of Implement This. Hi, Britta. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Matt? I am doing really well. I want to change things up a bit today. Okay. Uh, this one is not going to be a listener question. Oh. So a little bit of, little bit of a break from what we've had recently, but there's... There's something that I feel like we've been right right on the cusp of talking about, but we haven't actually gotten there. And, you know, thinking of some of the, the different out-of-the-box functionality that is that is super powerful, but maybe people, if they haven't worked with it directly, aren't comfortable with it yet, mm-hmm. is cues and routing rules. Ooh, yeah. I so love cues and routing rules. Chat about that a little bit? We should. We should. All right. So my my favorite like bar trivia version of talking about cues that mm-hmm. no one knows until I study for an exam um, is how much you can do with the queue item detail record. Okay. Which is like this little obscure record that no one but me cares about. But it's so exciting because it's kind of like everything you're going to put in a queue. So queues are so much better than views because we can mix whatever we want, which is yeah. awesome. So usually in views with the So like different of, different record types. Yeah. Yep. So usually like in an advanced find, you just have a list of accounts or just have a list of contacts. And you could maybe borrow some fields from related records, but you can't commingle records in there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, activities would be our only – breaking of that rule where we can have tasks and emails and things commingled. Yeah, but it's still a pretty slim list and it's not all the other entities that you're working yeah, with. Yeah, we don't get everything, all the mm-hmm. fields and everything we want. Um, and so what I love about queues is that we can put nearly anything in a queue. Mm-hmm. And then um, there's all this nice logic we can do about deciding who's working on what and automatically routing things to people and moving things from queue to queue. And my favorite part is that you can do it all in workflows, which of course is very exciting to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that's what I love so much about that queue item detail record that people don't care about um, is that that is kind of like the envelope. So if you're going to put something in a queue, mm-hmm. I think of that as putting that task or that email or that account or whatever case inside the, the envelope, which is the queue item detail. Yeah. And then the workflow manipulates that envelope and sends it off wherever you need it to be. Okay. You have so much fun with it. it kind of unlimited nerdy fun with queues <laughs> and queue item detail records. So queue item detail is that that nice envelope of work, and then that queue item detail is going to get picked up and actually worked on by somebody out of the queue. Yes. So that's what's tracking for you who has currently claimed that work. So some mm-hmm. organizations, you just have a bunch of work sitting in a queue, and then someone can claim it, so they put their name on it, mm-hmm. um, and that means that they're working it. Otherwise, your manager might assign you, push you work. And it's different than owning the record because you could still have the record owned by the account exec or by somebody mm-hmm. else. But since it's in your queue and you've claimed it, you're the one working it. Yeah. And we can also do auditing and tracking against that. We know when something enters and leaves the queue and when somebody picks it up and puts it down and what it is. And then all of that we can manipulate because we have our full workflow stack to use. So yeah. there's so much you can do with you know, creating records and automatically putting them in the right queue or using all of those conditional rules to route things around before you even get into all the power that has routing rules. There's so much you can already do yeah. um, with the tools you already know pretty well if you just learn this little extra bit about queues, yeah. which I like. Well, and I know the, the first time I was getting familiar with it, it was it was a little bit confusing to me uh, on the nature or the relationship of me as a user to one or more queues and the yes. queue items that sat inside of those it it was definitely it definitely took a little bit of familiarizing to figure out okay how do i actually go if i know a specific item that i want to go find how do i go and find that thing mm-hmm. 
Um, so you know, the, you can get to it a couple of, through a couple of different paths that I've found. One is you can go in through the queue, so choose the queue that you want to look at, look at the items that sit within there, and then find the, the one that you want. You can also do a search just for queue items regardless of the queue that they're in mm-hmm. and to be able to, to look for them that way. And that one, especially if there's something there where it's items that I've been working on or that have been assigned to me, looking at that, I don't, I don't have to go in through the queue to find the queue item necessarily, though that is definitely one way to, to look at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Something to keep in mind is that we have public and private queues. And public does not mean public, public, like to the outside world, just means within your organization. It's not locked down. Yes, yes. And what's really interesting is that um, if you have visibility on a queue, even if you don't have visibility, let's say I have a whole bunch of tasks that are mine and the way our security is set up, you can't see my tasks that I own, but I have them uh, in a public queue that we can both see, mm-hmm. you can actually see the queue item detail records. So you could see the name of my task, yeah. or the name of whatever it is, because the queue item detail always knows what it's actually hanging on to, what's inside the envelope. It can see that. And so what's interesting is that can create a little bit of a security. It feels like a panic because it looks like there's yeah. been a breach and all of a sudden Matt can see Britta's tasks and that's disastrous. Uh, not really. He's pretty awesome. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but it can create kind of some fear there. So you do need to be aware of... Um, the appearance of that breakage, it's not like, once again, you couldn't actually go in and open that task. The security holds firm, but the names of things. So if names are really yeah. sacred and protected in your organization, you have to be aware of that, that public queues and just commingling everything might yep. not work. I have one customer who we have so many queues per product because individual teams, they have all these Chinese walls between things and mm-hmm. they can't see over it, and it's really important. So we have a ton of cues, and then we're dynamically assigning things with lookups to make sure we get something into exactly the right queue. Got it. And doing things that way. The other thing to keep in mind, and this is a little funny, it's always um, when I'm coaching admins, it's part of what I do, um, is teaching people how to do their own implementation. And what nearly everyone who gets into queues runs into and calls me in a panic for is they assume that as an admin, they can automatically see into all of the queues in their system, Mm. which is typical in almost everything we do. If you have system admin rights, you can see everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is nothing outside of your view other than like personal views or personal dashboards of your users or something. Uh, That's not the case with queues. So um, for a private queue, you have to actually add the members explicitly. Mm -hmm. And that includes adding yourself, which is weird. We don't have to do that anywhere else. Right, right. But queues are so locked down in that way that as the admin, you can go look at, you know, something that you – it's funny because you can see that queue because you're the admin. Yeah. But you can't see the contents unless you add yourself. Right. Which is like this – panic step that everyone hits that it's just it just kind of is outside of the norm for us yeah a couple of other nuances as you're talking about adding people to private queues uh, as you, with many other areas of the dynamics platform you can add either a user or a team mm-hmm. but what's interesting is when you add a team to a private queue Behind the scenes, it actually goes and adds all the individual users. And the users at the time. At that particular yeah. point in time. So if you're if you're looking at kind of a team association model to different queues, keep that in mind because if you add a new person to that team after that team was added to a private queue, that new person isn't there. So you need to make sure you have that accounted for as you're setting up and managing teams into the future. Mm -hmm. That was really disappointing for me on this one customer where we have so many queues because maintaining those queues is really, um, it can be kind of labor intensive if you have a lot of queues and a lot of moving pieces. I had really hoped that having, because everything else for them is team-based, so it felt natural that teams could be in a queue and hopefully yeah. that work. And that doesn't work. We also tried having the team own the queue and hoping mm-hmm. the users would inherit some goodness that way. And that doesn't no. work either. So it is something, um, honestly, in all things in maintaining your system, you should have a checklist anyway. Yep. And that's just part of the checklist and maintaining it. It's just one more step. But yeah. um, you don't pick up a lot of freebies in self-maintaining queues here. Yeah. They're, they're pretty specific. So it was interesting. I ended up using, as part of a, a proof of concept, we were looking at kind of what's a good, efficient way to manage that that user versus team association to queues. And we, we came up with actually a, a pretty creative way to be able to use somebody's current team membership, that team's association to a an intersect record. So 
we called it the Team Q Association. Mm -hmm. Nice. (laughs) Um, And and we used that as a filter criteria on what people were going to go and see in, uh, it was an advanced find, um, technically a fetch XML query that was being run in the background. Mm -hmm. But we used the association of the team at that point in time as an additional step. So we ended up using more uh, public queues or having more people associated with private queues than you would otherwise think of doing. Mm -hmm. Um, But we did kind of this additional validation point of team association. Because even if you remove people from a team later, it doesn't go pull them off uh, of the the queue either. So it kind of has to work both ways. But um, there are definitely some things that you can do there to be able to kind of extend the functionality and be able to do some validation like that. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. and, and then that, that gives you a, a, also a quick view to be able to see, okay, for this team, what are the cues that team is associated to? And if you, say, wanted to use uh, some sort of automation, maybe a workflow to go and evaluate users who are associated with teams, you now have the record that's connected to both the queue and the members of the team that should be part of that. So mm-hmm. it, it makes it that step closer, a little bit easier to work with. Nice. Yeah. Nice. It's a good way to pull it all together. Yeah. Something I think that's different with queues also than what I do everywhere else, I like having views on dashboards. I think putting a view somewhere convenient for the user tends to make a lot of sense. And this is one of those places that I don't tend to steer users towards these custom views. I do use them here and there and sprinkle them on dashboards and things, but there are so many buttons that have to do with moving things through the queues, Mm -hmm. whether it's picking and releasing, which is that action of saying, I'll grab it, oh, just kidding, and putting it back, or having your manager take it, or um, those kinds of things. We don't get those buttons just hovering, you know, put it on a dashboard. And so um, I'm usually they're driving users back to an actual, you know, queues page yeah. or getting them to pop out that box so then they actually get all the buttons, mm-hmm. maybe even just keeping that up on another screen separately. But um, there is usually a view of something is sufficient for us. Yeah. And this is a place that there are enough, there are enough power tools hanging around that you do actually want to be um, where the queues are. Yeah. Uh, if I could, could could I suggest we talk a little bit about routing rules? Yes, absolutely. Fire away. Well, I'm I'm curious. Have you ever used them? A little bit. Okay. A little bit. Um, not as much as uh, workflows, obviously. I'm surprised uh, that you of all people and how much you've worked with queues that you're not like. Yeah, all over the place. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's Well, that's part of the value of our show is very transparent and honest. I don't yeah. use routing rules as much as you would think. I think part of that is I lean probably too heavy on workflows, mm-hmm. comfortable there. And um, in the projects that I've worked on, routing rules didn't quite fit what we were looking to do. Yeah. Um, and maybe it was a little more user involved, a little less automation. Well, and, and what's interesting about that is, I mean, routing rules at their core um, – they they actually build out a workflow for you on the mm-hmm. back end that does this assignment of of new work items to queues. So there is like when you're doing the the routing rules, you are building a workflow in a roundabout sort of way. You don't have the the yes. same level of control, but and I uh, love control though. That's the thing, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> you should know that about me by now. <laughs> oh, we all know that. <laughs> oh yes, it's not hidden at all. <laughs> but um, so. Uh, you know, kind of at, at the foundation of setting up routing rules, you have the routing rules themselves and you have routing rule sets. So the routing rule set, think of it as the container for all of the different rules that are going to be in place for figuring out which queue an item should go into uh, once it's created. Uh, so, And for that, you have the... It, there, there's only one routing rule set that you can actually have published at any one given time. So uh, that is just purely to be able to make sure you don't have conflicting routing rules. You know, one mm. says it should go to QA, another says it should go to QB, which one should win? Well, the one that wins is whichever routing rule set is published there. And then for each of the individual routing rules that you have, whether it's five or 500 or more, it's going to evaluate kind of consecutively through those rules until it finds one that matches where should this item go and drop it into that queue. Oh, okay. And once it finds one, it stops looking then. Exactly. So 
you can you can make sure that everything lands somewhere just by nature of making your very last routing rule uh, rule to be to have it go to some sort of default queue or something looking for a manual follow up, um, or you can just instruct people to go look for queue items that don't have an association to a queue yet. Mm. Um, but that that is one of those uh, places where it's it's workflow that's evaluating that behind the scenes. So there is the um, you know as as those get created, it's going to kind of process through that using. Uh, using those rules and they're built when you build them out it looks like you're building uh, kind of a hybrid between an advanced find and a workflow um, as you're as you're putting those together it's uh, very similar if you're comfortable with the advanced find screen and putting together those types of filters you already know how to build out the rules for routing rules no okay so you're maybe guilting me a tiny bit into using them more because I'm being stubborn We're, and just using workflows. Uh, <laughs> so every, everyone, so it sounds like everyone it's within can, my wheelhouse, and I should definitely go find an excuse to use them this week. Yes. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> I was going to encourage our listening audience to tweet at us if uh, whether whether you think shame Britta I, a little bit. It, w- no, whether whether you think I'm being overly harsh on Britta, let, let us know. <laughs> Bring it. It's not Come my on Twitter. In, it's not my intent here, but here we are recording this, and you can be the judge. You can you can weigh in. <laughs> On this, but yes, everything's coming up Millhouse, and like go and go and te- check it out, have some fun. Okay, <laughs> um, sounds good. Uh, one one thing that I will say about uh, routing rules is, if you are creating a new queue item uh, manually uh, in the inside of Dynamics, kind of from the the standard uh, user interface, the routing rules aren't going to automatically try to apply until you say apply routing rules to that item. Now that's different from if something is coming in via an integration or through the API. When those come in, they automatically trigger to go against that routing rule set. Mm-hmm. So just keep that in mind. You know that That is a little bit of a variation that may be great for you, depending on the, the way you're using queues. Uh, it, it might not, but it's just something to be aware of. It's the kind of the nature of of how those automatic routing rules get applied. Mm -hmm. I think in all things config, we always have to make sure we cover solution awareness. Mm -hmm. And another bummer of how pesky these keys are to set up is they are not solution aware. These Mm -hmm. are records. They're records that you're creating and you're relating them to other records in a specific environment. And um, you can do some magic with Mm import-export and, you know, create your own versions of something in another environment, but they're not part of the solution. Uh, What about routing rules? Yeah, uh, we are similarly limited in routing rules. Um, you know, this is this is where uh, you know, kind of deployment manager can be your friend in making that a little bit more repeatable. Looking mm-hmm. at some of those uh, DevOps capabilities that are out there inside of you know connecting to Dynamics and looking for repeatable process as you're moving things between environments. Um, using kind of more advanced tools like that can give you a leg up rather than just having like a list of records to import later. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's that's unfortunately uh, um, not one that's going to move with the solution. Yeah. And something to think about too as you are writing workflows, because there's always a place for those, um, is that since these records aren't moving with your solution, you want to be really careful that you're not tying a workflow to a very specific record. So Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking up an exact queue record and then tying your workflow to that, your workflow is going to break when you move it, unless you use some kind of, you know, Kingsway soft or something scribe to actually move the exact queue with the same GUIDs. Yep. Um, Your workflow is going to break. So you're going to want to use something like a a unique ID or a name, or I like to use um, a lookup field, do something dynamically Mm -hmm. to pull in my queues over workflow. But just be careful in that, as in all things, when you're tying automation to things that don't move with the solution, uh, there will be breakage. So be <laughs> smart in how you automate there. All right. I think that's it. I think that's it too. You've been listening to Implement This with Britta Rexted and Matthew C. Anderson. Do you have a business problem you'd like us to discuss on the show? Reach us through our website, implementthis.org, where you can also subscribe to the podcast. We're on Twitter too. Britta is at MacGyverCRM, and I'm at MC Anderson. Thanks so much for listening.